LGBTQ status um, and such. And that is the population, there's actually two kinds of two different types. There's called hemodialysis and there's peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis would be um, the blood dialysis, so you'll see them that they're going to a facility. Some do have home machines. Usually hemodialysis, it's more likely that they're going to a facility unless they're very, very house, um, immobilized, they have a different kind of condition, they can't travel. And in some cases, they'll have home hemodialysis equipment, at home dialysis equipment. Peritoneal is a different type of population, too, that they use a certain fluid, they have a membrane that is um, created, that they have an exchange, that they clear the blood, basically, and they clear um, the, the different um, byproducts. And there's a growing population of peritoneal dialysis. So there's the luxury of peritoneal dialysis is that you can do it usually at night when you're sleeping. You hook yourself up to a machine, or in some cases, there's a different type, and I'll go into that in a second. So those individuals usually will do it. They're working. They need to have their dialysis at night versus hemodialysis. Many of them are dependent on usually a three-time schedule per week. So about 60% of the hemodialysis, that means I'm going to a facility um, and getting my treatment, usually can last anywhere from four to six to eight hours, depending on the type of treatment. Um, those individuals are usually 60% go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and about 40%, give or take, will go Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Why is that important? When you come into a disaster, and I always say this with dialysis, the day it happens is going to change the whole entire way you're going to respond. Because we had a situation uh, where we had a director, which is a sideways tornado. For those that are not familiar, we learned this one time in 2012. It was a horrible experience. It came through and it put us in many areas in Maryland and also in Virginia and West Virginia. It literally took out and devastated the power structures in all those areas. And those areas that were down for almost three four weeks. And as a consequence of that, I had sudden outages. Well, it happened on Friday at 10 o'clock. And in this process, I was learning a lot more about dialysis and such. And I wouldn't realize until we started going through and doing a research project to see what the impact was and how we could start to anticipate how we could mitigate surge on dialysis populations in both facilities and also in the acute setting and the emergency departments. That happening on Friday at 10 o'clock uh, was a saver for us. And the reason why was most of the 60% of the population already had their treatment for week. They're good to go. Those facilities need to be back at work on Monday to keep them going on their schedule. The ones that are on Saturday, they were going to be impacted by it, but it would be the 40% of the population. And on top of that, you had a buffer, you had a summer, where those facilities normally don't operate. However, this population in this facility many times will open their doors on, a, on Sunday if they can't catch them up. So they can't do it on Saturday because the power's still out, but the power's coming back up on Sunday, they'll open on Sunday. And they can catch up. And that way that population is not in a situation where they're trying to find acute um, services in the emergency department, which also only has a finite number of chairs and such that they can do. So there's about 6,300 dialysis facilities across the country. and. Um, many of them are, most are with two major providers, the data of Presidius, and then there's a number of different independents across the country. Some are found in rural areas all the way to city and urban areas. It used to be a lot more in the hospitals. However, over the massive number of years that we've gone through in the progression of dialysis, dialysis has really rapidly transitioned into an outpatient service. Hospitals don't carry extra chairs. So when you're going for dialysis, if you're not familiar, there's a finite chair for a finite number of hours that you have to be in it. Sometimes in an emergency, they'll shorten the window of dialysis, but there's usually about a four hour minimum they almost need in order to keep everybody going. Many a times they'll open 24 hours a day and bring on more staff to try and keep up if another facility closes to try and bring in those other patients. But if the expectation is unlike hospitals, many people assume that, well, they'll just go to hospital, right? The hospital really, today, only has what they need for inpatient continued care. So they don't have a dialysis facility. Very rarely you'll find one there. On top of that, they only have a few units that they can do for the ICU patients and other patients that would need it for transplantation or on the, the chronic illness floor and the nephrology ward. So in those cases, you'll have that. So again, if you're running to the ED, 
there's not a lot of options. So then the emergency departments are thrust into a situation of trying to find a facility to get that patient back out. So we're going to try to Okay. So many of the dialysis dependents populations, some of them have some renal function. Their kidneys are functioning a little bit, so depending on what they are, they will increase amount in those treatments. So sometimes you might have some that only need two times a week initially, and then they get to that third week, that third day a week. So their, their kidneys aren't working. Fluid and toxins start to build up in their bodies because the kidneys can't flush it out. So as a consequence of that, they start taking on fluid. And the toxins that you normally your kidneys would clean out can't. So they can't get it out of the body. And that will, usually what you will find in the dialysis population is it's not just a kidney problem, then you see a significant impact on the cardiovascular. A lot of them will have uh, cardiovascular um, heart failure, CHF. They'll also start to have sometimes a lot of pulmonary function issues because they can't get the fluids out of the system. So there's a lot of fluid intake and it's really thrusts them in a quick, rapidly declining situation if they can't get that out. And that's really what dialysis function is. So many of them have what's called a cork. The one thing about dialysis patients is it's not something that you quickly can become a dialysis patient. It takes time to actually have a surgical procedure to install for hemodialysis. They have to put a specific port in. You don't want them to do an emergent one. It's very difficult, painful for the patient. It's not something that they recommend because they have to establish a vein and a, um, an access point. The same thing is for somebody who's on peritoneal. They have to go through surgery in order to make this kind of filter with their um, their peritoneum and such that can use this kind of viscosity of process that they take out the through a, a cycling process. That takes a long time to do as well. So dialysis is a deliberate, a process thing. They can't just do it on the fly. A lot of times it's, it's a surgical procedure, et cetera. So it's not something like, if your peritoneal will just make a hemo today, and with your hemo, I'm just gonna make a peritoneal today. It doesn't work that way. So that's why it really is a complex population. Um, the other thing is a lot of people don't realize in dialysis patients is that it, the fluid and the toxin backup rapidly causes them to have a number of cognitive deficits. So it is not uncommon for a dialysis patient in acute failure to show up to the emergency department and not know who they are, have no idea who their doctor is, and have no idea where they went and what their counts are or anything. Um, and this is one of the struggles with this population. Um, it can also kind of manifest and look itself as if a mental illness and such. Mm -hmm. And it's just because of the unfortunate the disease and the inability to flux, flush that out. So a lot of times, as soon as they get on dialysis, you can see a rapid change in the personality and such. Um, sometimes they can be combative. Again, it's not the patient. It's unfortunately the situation that's happening as a outcome of their um, condition. They have to really rely on a low salt diet. It's called a renal emergency diet. So in an emergency, if you know and notice an emergency is coming, you really want your dialysis population, your dialysis facilities and your providers to rapidly notify that population to say, start your emergency renal diet ASAP. And that basically is limiting fluids, limiting the amount of salt intake, et cetera, <coughs> and trying to keep them in a period of time that they can slow down what they would have to normally have expressed through their service. So, depending on when that happens, can put them in a situation. It can kind of sometimes expend them out, and sometimes it can't, depending on how much function they have. And really, it's the dialysis providers that know that. They know their patients. They know what their needs are and such. <clears throat> and again, for the kidney transplant patients, you really, they have to have their medications. So it is not uncommon, especially in a sheltering situation, you might have this population that comes in, and if they lost their medication, it's imperative that they get their medication replaced. So when you're thinking about your MRCs and you're thinking about the different partners that you might have and the healthcare um, providers that you might bring into your coalitions and such when you're setting up your shelters and such, these individuals will potentially show up. They may need their medications. Think about having somebody that might be a nephrologist on your team and such um, participate in your MRCs and such. If you haven't thought about including them, think about including them in your outreach and such to bring them on because that really, having that expertise or even on um, nephrology nurses and dialysis nurses, if you can get one on one of your MRCs, they're going to be an, a huge asset to helping you out. Even if you're trying to triage the patients from general population to additional services that they may need. 
And really, unfortunately, um, this, pa this patient population can go from severe to acute to death in days, and sometimes less than that, depending on the situation and where they are in their cycle. So that's why when we look at surge, and the first thing you will ask in almost all the studies that you'll see, um, particularly after Hurricane Sandy, we did a study on uh, diastasis for patient populations. A number of other hospitals did as well. They're in the top three patients that show up at the door. It was dialysis, it was unfortunate method methadone users, also electric zoo and durable, durable medical equipment, those are ventilator, power respiratory device failures, et cetera, are the ones that show up in the ED rapidly, seeking access to care and assistance. And the emergency departments will tell you immediately <laughs> they're the last patient they want to see showing up at their door. Because trying to stabilize an acute dialysis patient is extremely difficult. If they don't have a plan, they have to go through a whole entire process to test them to figure out what their um, their loads are and then be able to figure out and then find dialysis. So you're taking your emergency department population, your, your staff that are already dealing with an acute situation from their emergency, and now you're thrusting them in a situation where you have a very, very high um, resource, high demand needs for this patient to stabilize this patient because it is a, it is a process to stabilize an acute um, renal patient. So that was one of the things that what we're trying to do through all the different preparedness efforts is really to try and look at ways that we can bring dialysis coordination and really focus on that planning and making sure that we have integration with the different dialysis providers and the hospitals. Because sometimes they're not all talking together. We think they are, but they're not. In some areas that isn't always happening. So that's really what we wanted to talk about is one, give an understanding of what this is, and then I'll talk about how we can actually start to integrate that and make sure we're stabilizing those populations. So really, just high level for planning considerations, what you really want to kind of focus on is these patients have a lot of comorbidities. So again, if they're a real patient, it's likely that they may have a cardiovascular disease. It is likely that they may also have some mental illness because it is a byproduct of some of their um, condition. Um, it is likely that they may have also um, some level of COPD or other types of lung function issues that are a result of the food retention and such in the buildup. You want to also realize that they are immuno, they're really immunocompromised. So this population can get sick from others very readily and easily. So trying to, where possible, appropriately put precautions in and protections to minimize their exposure to other things is really going to be helpful too, especially if they're um, also a transplant patient. You want to minimize exposure to other people that may have some um, condition or an illness or such that. Um, Again, the dialysis treatment availability. Engaging with your partners, engaging with your providers, engaging with your networks, because the luxury of CMS is CMS kind of doing all of the dialysis across the country, has established a framework and a network and also resources, which we'll get into. And then really, when you're looking at that, when they're in shelters, it was really coordination of follow-up care and such, and making sure that they get back into their community when they're, say, they're leaving a shelter or such that they're getting back to where they are, they are going to be safe and that they can get connected back to the healthcare community, meaning they're able to get back into their dialysis provider, they're able to get back to their nephrology doctor and such. Because that disconnect, if they go home and they don't have that, can yet again thrust them in a situation and they're bouncing back to the hospital and creating another level of surge again. <clears throat> and also looking at individual care plans. So, okay, what did I do? There we go. So, yeah. so some of the ways in which we're trying to help. So in the federal government, uh, we have the HHS Empower Initiative that I worked with um, through ASPR in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So one of the things that we started to do was try and put together data that could be helpful from the durable medical side. So this captures a small portion of those individuals that are at home, that they're living in their house and they're using equipment. It captures this information as well as a number of other different uh, pieces of equipment such as ventilators and other such like that. Beginning to understand the dependencies on these pieces of equipment, that they are many times like maintaining life saving, you can start to understand the timelines that they're going to show up. We know for a fact that this population is rapidly overwhelming emergency departments and the EMS system because unfortunately we have trained all of our um, community members that if you call the doctor office at 5 o'clock or 7.59 a.m. or before, 
you'll get a recording that tells you that if this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911 and go to your local emergency department. So as a consequence of that, we really actually trained this entire community, whether you have an illness of a cold or such, that really this is the place to go is that one-stop shop. And unfortunately, it's turning into really a difficulty in trying to triage and coordinate in an emergency because you have everybody that knows that they're the trusted secure providers and that they can get you some level of access so that's where they rapidly will call as EMS or they'll go um, to hospitals and some of them will self-evacuate they'll have family members that will get them to a hospital because they know that they might have access to power or care and such so <clears throat> doing this we're able to start to provide this public map so we did have HP I call it the 2.0 map. Um, we did have an original map that was rolled out. We just recently rolled this one out. It's streamlined, it has more information. We're gonna be adding more data. It's a public map, it's available to you, it's de-identified, you can't tell anybody. Goes down to the zip code, so it goes to state, territory, county, and zip code level, and tells you the total number of electricity dependent in your community. It also tells you the total number of Medicare beneficiaries in your community, which you don't get anywhere else. Um, so that's also another piece of information that when you look at census and such, while they're extremely important, they give you a lot more round-outed information. This actually gives you a count on a monthly basis. We actually go and say of 52 million people, how many have a claim and how many are living independently in the community. So we also have created de-identified data sets too. So there's three national capabilities that we have and the de-identified data set can go to the health departments and they in turn can take that information and share it with their other partners, their healthcare coalitions, their ESF-8, their ESF-14, their ESF-6 partners. Um, they wanna use it for planning it preemptively and, and anticipate. This de-identified data set actually provides more detailed information. So while it's still de-identified, you don't know Mrs. Smith's there, you do know how many by type of equipment, including at-home dialysis, as well as we've also included healthcare services, including facility dialysis. So your health department has access to de-identified information for everybody in CMS that's take, that has dialysis every month on an updated basis, and it's down to the zip code. Again, state, county, and zip code level, they have those counts for them. So you can start to use that as a planning tool, an idea of how to better anticipate how many people in your community that might need dialysis and start to figure it out. Taking that information, my suggestion is rough order, 60% of that number is going to be on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 40% is on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So you can start to anticipate when you're communicating with your healthcare coalitions and your providers, you start to get a framework and an idea of what might be my throughput issue and what type of assistance I might need. This was a huge issue um, after the Boston bombing. When they went in lockdown for the manhunt, they had to lock down all transportation. The community that rapidly was impacted dialysis and the issue that came up was they have to get their care so suddenly they were thrust in a situation that they're doing a manhunt they were rapidly trying to figure out how to provide because many dialysis patients rely upon the MTA or your specific um, access um, uh, ambulant providers and such so they're not going there just many times because they have access to it themselves they're relying on that that basically that transportation program that pretty much every county or some for the most part provides for those individuals that are at risk and need to go back and forth to doctors. So when that gets shut down, you suddenly eliminate access. And that was one of the things that they had to work through in Boston was to be able to limit access and get them to bring the dialysis patients through and such. Um, and that also came into play also during the civil unrest issues that we had across the country. Um, dialysis immediately was impacted because of that. So many of them had to quickly work with their local public health agencies to say, okay, we have to bring our patients and we're going to pick them up, but you're telling me I can't drive anywhere. So how do we do this? How do we get the patients to the treatments and then get them safely home and also make sure that we're not you know, trespassing in a certain area that you're locked down or in, 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 in essence that you're telling me I can't transport them, so how do we do this? How do we work together? In some cases, they needed assistance from state and local uh, assets. In some cases, they were able to identify different vehicles and they were able to coordinate that through and they told them where to go and where not to go. The other thing that is a luxury that the dialysis community has is KSER. It's the Kidney Community Emergency Response Coalition. This is a contractor that CMS has put together. It's been in place since about 2006 after Hurricane Katrina. 
the first thing they said is we need dedicated materials and plans and assets and resources and coordination capabilities in which to get the individuals. In Katrina, the individuals didn't know who their provider was. They said, well, where do you go? I don't know, a bus picks me up and they bring me to my dialysis facility. It still happens today. Again, many of those, the issues with cognitive deficits that come with this disease. So as a consequence of that, the other thing was trying to get them to have plans and such on them. The CASER program, as soon as there's a major declaration or such, even beforehand, will activate. If they're notified, they will activate and work directly with the network. They're required to work with the networks to identify the populations and find the populations and get the populations into a provider. So they're an asset that can actually help you. They have a hotline that's 24 seven. They have materials that are readily available, planning tools and such. They have all the information about your network. So you're saying, I'm in, what st I'm in this state and I don't know who my network is. It has it there, it has a map. And actually you can see the different, um, different networks that they have and such that they now have that you can actually go and figure out who's my network, who's the contact for my network, who should I be working with, who should I be contacting. They have resources for um, providers, they have resources for planning, they have resources for patients. It also has very patient-friendly information, so in plain language that people can readily understand. Um, it's really a soup to nuts type of option. It's all web-based, they have phone numbers you can call, and they've been a phenomenal asset. I can tell you we've worked with them for years on responses and they're readily able to. We have a new group that's there and they're just really energized and ready to work and really collaborate and help coordinate and make sure that they're taking care of their patient populations. So we currently have, they've shifted it down to, it's different. there used to be a lot more different providers across the country. And what they realized is they wanted to bring it down, tighten it up, and make sure that they had a specific group, and that way they could also streamline. So it wasn't uncommon before, if you ask people when they were doing dialysis planning, coordination, and collaboration, that I have this great network, they're fantastic, they answer my phone, they're, they're great, they, they're proactive, they're such, and then they had some that were like, well, they're sort of reactive, they're sort of maybe having some resources, but sometimes they expect me to do a lot more than theoretically what I'm supposed to be doing, and they're kind of looking at me. So really CMS took a prospective and a very collaborative nature when they set up the new contract to say, you know, we're gonna tighten this up and we're gonna get some sort of level standards and such so that there'll be a gradual consistency that you're gonna see a part and transition through these networks as you go through. There will be, and I think some of that will come up, is there will be some kind of bumps in the road as you have, may have a new provider for your coordinator network. Um, it might be a new group that you're working with, not the group that you did before. Um, they're with, they are really trying to work to make sure that they're doing this and coordinating it also with the CASER. So they really brought all this together Case used to be kind of with a separate group, and now they have one of the groups working as also that element too. So it actually really helps to bring the things together. <clears throat> as noted before, and here's just kind of an example, you can go to their website, and literally it's one of the best user-friendly websites. It's not something that you have to drill and try and go from one site to another site to another site to find it. They really target it towards patients, professionals, and such. And their search engine's really good. And they're adding more and more tools. They have a lot more tools coming in the next couple of um, months. So keep paying attention to that and keep checking back. You'll see more information there. The hotlines are always there. And I encourage you to reach out. They are a really great group um, and they will provide you. And if you have questions and such, you can totally ask them. <clears throat> so really, just a really quick summary. Um, I have, thought I had another slide in here and I don't. We also have uh, what's called the Tracy Asper Tracy, some of you are aware of it and some of you aren't. It's the Technical Resource Assistance Center and Information Exchange. And it's aspertracy.hfs.gov. And it's a phenomenal site that actually, we've actually collaborated across the dialysis community. So we bring subject matter experts. We don't just go out to anybody in Google search and say what's a great plan for dialysis or great resource. In collaboration with KSER and other experts across the community, we brought in vetted people and vetted materials. So they do have actually additional resources that you might be able to find that might answer some of your questions. If you don't have something, if you go into it and you sign, you just have to sign up, simple, um, and it allows you to go in. You can look for a topic collection on this information, but you can also 
Again, at Assistance Centers, Monday through Friday, they have eight to five, you can actually make a phone call and get a person and ask a question, and they will tap those experts, and we have them from across the country that are vetted people, that are not just, it's anybody who says they are, but we actually vetted them, that will be able to get information back to you to help you answer some of the questions you may have, or also coordinate and connect you with CASER as well, and really get you connected so you can answer questions there. But again, I really do encourage everyone to go and check CASER, continue to check CASER. If you have questions, email them, reach out to them, um, but also you can also reach out to Tracy as well. And just really in general, so kind of the goals that we have from data and such, we're able to start to help their health departments in partnership with their other partners, so collaborating together, you really actually have a pretty complete look at the dialysis population for your data. From that, you can actually start to make planning scenarios, looking at, again, that Monday, Wednesday, Friday versus Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and also looking at what type of needs they might have. You have it both from those that are at home um, through the Empower data, but we also have those that are facility-based. So through that de-identified data set, that really does give you a rich piece of information that you can leverage to look at what is my planning scenario? What does my population look like in my community? And this goes down to the zip code, which can help you. It also helps from the hospital areas in the EMS because it actually can help you start to look at your catchment area and say what would we might be. And I do encourage you to also communicate with your networks and such because the dialysis providers, the one luxury about it is that they don't get paid <laughs> if they don't actually deliver dialysis. So there is, and there is a um, strong carrot there to actually get them into their facilities to coordinate that care. So I talked to some of them and they said, if this is really happening, I really wanna know about it so I can go talk to that hospital and make sure that we're plugged in and we're indicating and that way we're actually able to, more importantly, continuity of care, but also because they can't, they, they have to be billable. So that is one factor. They don't want their patients going to hospital for that. So hopefully I've given you some <coughs> good information and just some partners and resources and materials. But now I'm actually gonna turn this over to the real experts that are on the ground and that are doing this work every day. My part's the easy part, their part is not the easy part, and they're gonna tell you also how they've kind of tackled and worked with this approach and what they're going forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Wayne, and then Wayne's gonna bring over Betsy after. Thank you, Kristen. Um, you know, she scared me a little bit there because she said we had the, the uh, hard part and I'm like, I thought y'all had the hard part. <laughs> um, so Kristen that gave a lot of great information. You're going to hear a lot more information uh, in Georgia. What, what I'm here today is I'm going to talk a little bit about real world scenarios. We're going to talk about in Mississippi, we're fortunate enough to have one of the best case of best cases when it comes to uh, working with the networks. Our, net, our relationship started with Network 8 during Katrina uh, and uh, it's just matured uh, over the years. So going back just a little bit, I'll tell you how we got started. It predated me. I was the local emergency manager during Katrina and my supervisor, many of y'all might know, Jim Craig, uh, had this job for me. He's moved up. and. Uh, one day, about four days in, five days into Katrina, he got a call and there were people dying uh, or, or about to die because they needed to be dialyzed. And that's really the first time that um, they even considered this problem. So he started, of course, now he's preparedness director uh, for ESFA. Most of you all are familiar with that, Public Health and Medical Surge. For all of the state of Mississippi, we're a centralized state, so he had all of Mississippi. This is just one more problem, but it's a, a very acute problem. Luckily, he stumbled across a phone number for Network 8, and they said, we got this. And he said, so what do I need to do? And they said, no, 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 we got this. This name is this location. They actually came in from that point and took care of all of the ESRD for Mississippi. They, they picked the patients up. They worked with all of the providers in Mississippi, even outside Mississippi, to get patients moved. A lot of them had to be moved away from the coast because it was a number of weeks. I was 150 miles in and we were without power for 15 days. So down on the coast, you know, they were without power for long periods of time. Uh, 
But um, so they, they came in and just a couple of things that they did is within the first five days of taking this over, they started, they got with all the local facilities and got their records and started working with emergency managers to locate um, patients that hadn't surfaced yet to make sure and start trying to locate uh, where they were to make sure everybody was getting dialyzed. They started tracking these mission, missing patients and they, they worked with directly with in Mississippi and, uh, there are a number of uh, providers for SRD but most of them are, are one of th there's, there's three majors uh, Fresenius is the largest I think they're probably the largest in the country and then there's two others and then there's some independents but in Mississippi when this happened they reached out and there was no there was no competition between the providers if they if, when network eight called they said, I have a patient, they said, we can take three. And, and uh, I, I met with, in preparation for this um, presentation, I met with Network 8. Our, our uh, relationship is so automatic that we forget to meet. And, it, and, and I appreciate this opportunity because I, I think that it's very important to have these relationships prior to the, the storm. And we had kind of, I hadn't met with them in a long time, so I, I went and visited with them. Um, but one of the things I asked uh, Network 8, I asked the new director there, uh, what she wanted me to tell y'all. Because really, they're the stars of this show. Uh, they should be here presenting because they're the ones that do this. I'm just relaying what, the work that they do in this area. But the one thing that she wanted to, to know, and that's the reason I put this no competition over here, is because when, when they made the phone call, it didn't matter whose patient it was, which, uh, which company normally had that. They just opened the doors and um, and patients. And to this day, a lot of them have never even asked for reimbursement for that. So that was a big, a big success story. Another thing that they did is they actually put two nurses, one on day and one on night shift, in the, uh, what we call the, the PHCC, the Public Health Command and Coordination Center, which is our ESF-8 Emergency Operations Center for the state of Mississippi. And they were there hand in hand taking care of this. So some of the statistics that uh, I found out, and this was very really good for me to know, uh, in Mississippi we have 82 facilities. 15 of them are independent and all the rest of them are one of those three that I mentioned before. We have about 6,000 patients in, the, in, in Mississippi, typically that's the average census and it averages out about 70 patients per unit uh, in Mississippi. Some of the things that, that they're doing now, uh, investing with the, the director, she's been with them since Katrina, but she's recently taken over as director, and they had no emergency planning when Katrina came. They really were like a lot of us. You know, they had some ideas what they would do and maybe some procedures, but no real planning. Now then they have uh, specific annexes, they have a, an over -oper, uh, over operating plan, uh, a concept of operations plan rather, with uh, instant specific annexes for hurricane, tornado, ice storm, all that. And they and, and actually Network 8 covers Mississippi, Alabama, and, and Tennessee. I think we saw that on the thing earlier. So they, they do a hazard vulnerability assessment and those are the, the main hazards in the southeast or, or your weather related events. So that's what they uh, that's what they have at specific annexes. They also do a yearly exercise with CASER. Uh, and to be honest with you, until very recently, uh, about uh, six weeks ago, I wasn't even really sure who CASER was because we do so much with Network 8. Uh, and, and through, uh, Chris and I were talking earlier, in Region 4, we have a, an ESF-8 Unified Planning Coalition that's very active. We get together once a quarter. And Kaser actually came to our uh, UPC in Charleston about six weeks ago and, and, and gave us a presentation. That's really the first that I had uh, introduction to Kaser. It's, it's a great program. I would recommend if y'all have that in your areas, reach out to them, they'll come, they'll tell you what they've got. They've got a lot of resources. So, yeah, so the Department of Health uh, not only have, uh, 
as the network ain't grown in this area, obviously uh, we have. We, we develop planning um, and we do a lot of uh, a lot of work in emergency response, particularly um, so getting to healthcare coalitions. That's what I'm trying to get around to. Those, everybody loves that word, I know, and it's, it's uh, the big buzzword with HPP. Um, so in Mississippi, we have the Mississippi ESF 8 uh, Healthcare Coalition, it's a statewide coalition, and the way we operate is it is automatic when the PHCC stands up when we go to into response mode at either 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock that first day, depending on the, the stride that the governor takes when he does his briefings and it rolls down. The healthcare coalition stands up. Network Aid is one of our partners, Mississippi Hospital Association, all the long term care associations uh, are partners in this coalition. We push information out from, uh, you know, situational awareness of what's going on in the state, what their, what their priorities are. But we also reach out to these organizations to bring back uh, what's going on down in the field. That's how we get a lot of our situational awareness. So Network 8 is a large partner in that. Um, and so so is, uh, Network 8 uh, participates in the me hack. I'm sorry. I thought there was another slide in there. Um, uh, so some of the things going forward, I mentioned the relationship piece. Uh, in Region 4, some of y'all, I see some, some faces here that are from Region 4, uh, know that relationships are really the, the backbone of response for us in the Southeast. Uh, typically, we're rural, country, uh, real, rural states, rural counties, and then you just you have four or five people doing the same jobs you have limited manpower limited resources so you have to depend on knowing where you can go to get the resources and so we have a, a in mississippi we always say we, we meet when the skies are blue so we know each other when the skies are gray <clears throat> sorry so the um it, like I say, I, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with, with Network 8 for this because th that has strengthened that relationship. I would recommend that you meet, get out, and you know your, your network. Some of the things that we're going to work with Network 8, I've talked a lot about what they do for us, which is pretty much everything in the response realm. But what we're going to be doing with them going forward is helping them with, uh, with their facilities that they work with meet the CMS requirements. They've got a lot of questions about that. We also do uh, a lot of work in the EOPs, uh, Merch Operation Planning area for them. We have district planners uh, all over the state of Mississippi that, that go in and actually help them. We build templates for the ESRDs, and then our planners go in and sit down and meet with the facilities and help them get that, that template filled out uh, so that they can uh, have their EOPs. And they're actually going to be participating in our uh, full-scale exercise. So, uh, with that, uh, I appreciate the time. Uh, and <coughs> Any Good morning, I'm from Georgia. No, I'm really coming in from New York originally. <laughs> 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 I've only been down here 10 years, but I can turn around if you'd like it. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, what I think, well, no, I lived in North Carolina too, and I, I really have a talk down there. Up there, sorry. Um, I'm Betsy Katie, I'm with the Health Department and I work in public health and emergency preparedness. I've been here for 10 years uh, doing preparedness and I'm sort of schizophrenic. No, I am schizophrenic. Who? No, yes. Anyway, um, my background is environmental epi and tox, uh, but I took care of my mother for 10 years. And when I started working in public health preparedness at the county level in Western Maryland, one of the first questions that came up was, what are we going to do with the homebound? And I said, wow, because I took care of my mother and there was no connect to the community except me. And so I've been working with vulnerable population planning for the last 12 years at the county level, which I think everybody should work at, uh, and then at the state level for the last 10. And what I want to do today is just go over a little bit about public health in Georgia so you have an idea of where you are sitting. 
I mean, you're in Atlanta, I know you know that. Um, we've had bridge collapses and all kinds of wonderful things. Also, I was out of electricity this morning, so I had a shower, but I couldn't do my hair. And I have to tell you, after coming here and having to talk about electricity-dependent durable medical equipment, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was like, really, really? Did you have to do that? Um, so it, it started my day off. But anyway, what I want to do is talk about public health preparedness and the healthcare coalitions, just to give you an idea of where we are. Um, and planning for at-risk populations. How many here just do dialysis? Aha! It becomes overwhelming when you start looking at the populations that are vulnerable during any kind of emergency. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about that, then talk about our Preparedness. We actually have a, a dialysis work group in Georgia that started after the ice storm two years ago, which was a cluster flake. Um, and it really pointed out the problems of actually uh, getting people to dialysis and dialysis centers staying open. And then I want to talk about the durable medical equipment data that we've had for the last two years and how it was pushed down during Hurricane Matthew and how we use that. So, Hold tight, we're going to start off this way. Okay, in Georgia, we have the public health preparedness and the healthcare preparedness. You all know that. Shake your head, let me know you're awake. Good, okay. We have 18 health districts. You know how many counties there are in Georgia? 159. It's, and each county has its own board of health, believe it or not. But we have 18 health districts that has a health director who is a physician that is essentially hired by the state, by the health commissioner, um, but he reports to the district. I'll give you a map, hold on. Okay, the map on your left are the health districts, and the map on the right are the health, uh, used to be, and they still are, the regional coordinating hospital regions. There are 14 of those. Um, those are now our health care coalitions as well. So we have 14 separate health care coalitions throughout the state. And Kelly Nado, who is the head of our um, health care preparedness program. How many people know Kelly? I think the world knows Kelly. Just, well, just one. That's okay. We're from here, too. Um, and each is essentially an independent entity that deals with mutual aid within the health care coalition region that they're in. Um, and so if I went to another agency in Georgia, I would give you another map. I could probably put up 100 different maps because everybody has taken the 159 counties and divided them the way they wanted to. So it's been, it's been really interesting working in Georgia. When I first got here, I was working in environmental epidemiology and it was lovely because I get a call and say, well, I'm in Coombs County. I said, okay, hold it. I said, think of a clock. Tell me what quadrant you're in so I can at least try to find the county. It was, it's just huge. Okay. Um, what I've been doing over the last couple of years, and Michelle McMahon, who's sitting in the back, who works in one of our health districts, has also been working on vulnerable population planning. We have three sort of groups of people that are at risk that we sort of define. Uh, how many are familiar with the Social Vulnerability Index? The CDC has a map on their website. Hello? Okay, we developed one for using the same 14 variables. We developed an atlas for Georgia, um, which essentially, and I had to print it out because I'm old school and I like something in my hand and I have a hard time comparing one page to another online. Um, and essentially put it together. And social vulnerability is essentially based on census information um, and it essentially maps, it's, the index essentially takes 14 variables and goes ahead and ranks your census tract areas within your county or within your district or within the state um, and so you get a really sort of a 4,000 foot level or 10,000 foot level view of what it looks like but if you go within your community I'm sure people who are planning within their county or their city know exactly where these populations are because you've lived there and you know this. It's a great tool to use, but it essentially provides information on low income. Uh, there are 14 variables, I'm not gonna go into all of them. Um, a person 17 years or younger, uh, low income, uh, no high school diploma, it, it just goes on. It also deals with um, housing and transportation. So there's a no car available <coughs> variable in there as well. And it's the kind of thing that when you start looking at this, What's nice about these maps, and it's, it's svi.cdc.gov um, that you can go to and get information for any county in the United States and any state in the United States. 
Um, and essentially, it's great to give to politicians. Did I say that? Mm -hmm. Because it's on a it's on a quintile basis, and all you have to do is go the darker the color, the more variable, and that's all you have to say to people in it and communities and everybody else. It, it's a really good tool. However, that's one part of the vulnerable population. Well, that's also my grandson up there. Um, but he lives in Detroit, so go figure. Anyway, the next one are access and functional needs. How many here have been dealing with planning for access and functional needs? Ah, yes. Okay, we have a coalition in Georgia that started after Katrina. There's a lot of learning that went on, lessons learned in Katrina. And the coalition is for, are you ready? It's the Georgia Emergency Preparedness Coalition for Individuals with Disabilities and Older Adults. It took us an hour to get from elderly to older adults. You've been on those committees, I know. Um, and we uh, have been around, uh, I came here 10 years ago, and we pretty much started right after Katrina, and we have the state level and some local folks in preparedness response, which includes GEMA, Red Cross, uh, Division of Aging, uh, Mental Health, and Public Health together at the table with persons with disabilities and aging and organizations that represent them. Um, it's a slow process, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, but we have we put together a functional and access needs toolkit. Um, in 2014, after FEMA went ahead and sent us their guidance, which the Department of Justice decided, oh, this is good, we'll use this as, yeah, anyway. For those of you who know, you're following with me. I go fast, I know, but I'm from New York, so I'm sorry, this is where it goes. Anyway, we also had a work group in uh, with the healthcare preparedness program when the money didn't cut to a half as we saw this morning um, and we had uh, essentially a resilience work group and it's split into two and half of the people for the healthcare preparedness program and for the coalitions and it's to provide the coalitions with some some guidance talk about a resilience and half of the group went to coup planning continuity of operation planning for the facilities healthcare facilities within their healthcare coalition region and I was on the other one, which was dealing with the adverse population in the community. And what we came up with, and I do have an acronym for this, was MARNIPs, which are the medically at risk, non-institutionalized people within the community. These are the people on dialysis. These are the people who provide surge of hospitals during any kind of emergency. And the problem is they're out in the community. They have some connect with providers, but not everybody. Um, but they're out there. And so we have those three. And what I've done is, okay, here's your math lesson for the day. What is this called? <laughs> Louder. The Venn diagram. Thank you. It was probably the easiest way to do it. But when you start looking at these three sets of vulnerable populations, what you find is the people who are in the middle are the most vulnerable because they have, one, they have something within each group. And how do you get to these people? Don't know. But it's, it's where we're trying to, we're working on all three but we're trying to put this all together. And then you throw dialysis in all of this, and that's the medically at risk. Okay, MARNIS, we do have an acronym. Um, and those essentially, and I've talked about this, but any interruption of their services. And, uh, and Kristen just talked about dialysis and, and what happens when Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are interrupted, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday are interrupted. And what you find is that's one group. Um, and I, you know, we started looking at our functional access needs. We have a workshop in May to revisit our document, which was done in 2014, and we're going to make it a little more user friendly so the local folks can take a look at how to, to essentially provide needed resources during an emergency. Um, but one of the one of the things that came up from this was, hold on, I'm just. I'm, my train just went off the track. I'll be back. Hold on. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. Um, oh, the anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. As my mother would say, I'll call you at 2 in the morning. Um, I remember this. Okay. Um, she did call me one time, and my mother loved musicals. And I took care of her. I did the assisted living for her until she ended up at, at an assisted living facility. But I worked with her, and she was down the block from me. Two o'clock in the morning, she called. Of course, day and night were, were just about the same. She passed away when she was 91, but in her late 80s, she called and said, Oh, Betsy, Betsy, you know, the phone rings, my fingernails are in the ceiling. I said, What, what, what? She said, Oklahoma's on TV. <laughs> Mom, you know what time it is? I said, I'll talk to you in the morning. So, anyway, I'll be back. <laughs> okay, um, all right. I digress, <laughs> and I do that often. Okay, 
two years ago, or it's almost three years ago, 2015, I received a, a, a uh, file of the durable medical equipment, de-identified data from our uh, public, our FEP director, Scott. He said, here, do something with this. And since my background is in epidemiology and I like to play around with young music, it's okay. And I sat there and started looking at the data that Christine's group had from the power that sent down to the state. And we have 159 counties, we had zip code data, we had 159 counties, and I looked at them and said, oh, I don't know what to do with this. So what I did was I organized it by health district and summarized it by health district, but also by regional coordinating hospital area, really, because these are two essential, they, they plan together, but they plan separately as well for response, and so I did. But I really wasn't sure what to do with the information. Um, the updated data, and this really hasn't changed much as far as numbers because people come in and out of these data set. We have about 75,000 people in Georgia who are on electricity dependent durable medical equipment. It includes in facility dialysis. We have about 16,000 folks in, in Georgia who are on dialysis. Um, in home dialysis, oxygen services, about 27,000. Um, home health, which is another thing I'll talk to you afterwards over drinks. Um, ventil ventilators, uh, motorized wheelchairs, scooters, uh, electric beds, um, oxygen services are, are probably the biggest. And uh, we get calls from um, shelters when there's a need for oxygen. It comes into our ESFA desk at the State Operations Center. Um, what I did was I took the information and put it by county, and this is the same data. I, mean, you just, I love epidemiologists, so you just like to throw data around. Uh, this is for one county in Georgia, but it includes the um, essentially the number of Medicare beneficiaries, and the county is 124,000 people. But you can see that it's still a lot of folks in the county and trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do with this information? And I will put this question out to you because we're trying to work on how do we get this into planning and not into response, where we get to the point of how do we use this information um, today, not when the skies are gray, did you say? Yeah, mm -hmm. when the skies are gray. Okay. So this gives you an idea of the 16,000 folks in Georgia during the ice storm. Um, we had gridlock for 24 hours on the major highways. We now have it because we had a bridge collapse. Um, it's Atlanta, <laughs> but we have MARTA. Um, and it's the kind of thing that um, what happened really pointed up uh, the issue of dialysis because we had people on the roads that needed dialysis. We had people who, you know, and it wasn't something that was like a hurricane where you could do early dialysis and things like that. It was just a real cluster. I mean, it really was flake. Um, anyway, so what we have is, and our healthcare preparedness program uh, essentially put together uh, a dialysis work group. We decided, and, and the theme of this conference deals with partnerships, <coughs> capabilities, innovation, but also partnerships. And the dialysis work group, essentially the mission is to ensure the continuity of healthcare. Um, talking about not having to go to the hospital and, and work, but it was focused on dialysis patients. And I know you can't do this at the group. I understand that. Um, that's what we, we, we get pushback on saying, well, but I have this group, this group, this group, and this group. Um, but the dialysis work group has been wonderful because we've started planning. How many know that the dialysis companies cannot transport patients to the dialysis center? Oh, good, not everybody. We learned that at the dialysis work group. It's something in federal or national regulations, who knows what. They are not, during good times, they're not allowed to transport them back and forth. So what happened was we talk about uh, preparedness planning and what happens when, uh, situation awareness as well as access to medical care. And we put together sort of a checklist. Even if, what is the biggest lesson learned and the biggest need, room for improvement when you do an exercise? Communication, yeah, and it, and it is true. And it, it deals with get to know these people ahead of time, find out what they can do as well as who they know and who they call. I mean, I think to me the best thing you can have is somebody on your list going, okay, I need this, who do I call, where do I go, and you get the communication going that fast. Um, so what we do is we work for points of contact with the 14 healthcare coalitions, that's what the HCC is. Uh, work on planning and exercise, um, including the major dialysis providers. It was wonderful having them at the table because we found out what they did. We found out how robust their emergency response is uh, for their units, but also the idea of mutual aid with, with the other dialysis companies. 
um, and the equipment they have. We also found out that during Sandy, they had trouble getting their nurses into New York because they needed to be credentialed. Uh, so these are things that, that came up. We don't have, um, what's it called? Compact. Thank you, reciprocity. This is good. Uh, reci <laughs> this is wonderful. Reciprocity um, for this yet, but it's something that we need to work on because it's not that they're out of scope of practice, they're going to other dialysis centers and, and working. It's just something that we need to work on. So it's really pointed up a lot of different things. So we've exchanged communication, uh, contact information, um, as well as engaging the transport companies as well. MARTA actually has a bus system. It has a non-medical transport system within Georgia. Uh, trains don't go too far. They go here and way. If you've gone to the airport, it's wonderful. Um, it doesn't go too far, but it's nice to have. Um, but it's the kind of thing that they actually have a medical, they have a non-medical transport. They, they come to the table. Uh, it's really nice. We also have other transport companies across the state. This isn't just for Atlanta. Um, just verification. These are our Jason Sanford, who was our vulnerable population planner, who essentially led this um, effort. Took a job in Chicago and took me two weeks to try to talk him out of it, but I couldn't. Um, and, but it's the kind of thing that, again, part of the issue goes to how many vulnerable population groups can you plan for? How many drivers do you have to take the lead in doing this? It's not just the money. It really takes a driver to focus on a specific area and become the best there is. So we're going <laughs> to kidnap him and bring him back. I mean, he's wonderful. He stayed, you know, he was at the State Operations Center during uh, our responses and things like that. Knew who to call. He works with Pacer, works with, with the, the Penn State Regal folks as well. Um, and it's the kind of thing that we're going to need to replace him as well. I don't have all the contacts. Um, okay, he put this slide together. These are partners. We work with EMS as well. Um, and, it, and I'm going to get into what we did during Hurricane Matthew. But it's the kind of thing that it all of all of these folks are partners. Um, okay, the win-win, and Kristen talked about it. They can keep, you know, uh, it's focused on dialysis patients, uh, decrease in hospital surge, but it's a, a, real, a really good example of private-public partnerships and disaster planning. They can continue to build. You have to keep that in the back of your head. Um, okay, I'm, I don't know how much time I have. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> You may not look so, but I do as well. Um, okay. Hurricane Matthew, October. It was a lovely month. Um, knew this thing was coming in, and we had hospitals on the coast. We had mandatory evacuation on the coast. Uh, we don't have the bigger coastline, but we do have one that gets hit often enough. Um, and so there was a federal declaration of 30 counties that was made, um, and then Governor Deal ordered a mandatory evacuation. Um, if anybody has ever dealt with hurricanes, the timing is absolutely incredible and difficult. I, when I first got here, they were just about to start an evacuation and, and healthcare and everything else, and it turned. The hurricane turned, and so they stopped it like within an hour. Uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, it, it really is is incredible. Um, we have contraflow coming. You can only get to, you can only get to Savannah on route on the Interstate 16. It is the most boring highway you have ever been on. It is, there's, there's not a turn in it for, for two and a half hours, and you just go straight down. Well, as you get closer to the coast, you see all of these gates on the exits, and they have contraflow, which goes on. When they evacuate, they get everybody coming out on all four lanes going, going north and out of the area. It's okay until you need to get emergency vehicles back in to evacuate hospitals and do things like that. And I'm not going to go into all the evacuation. It was, it was really incredibly done, and it, it really had to do with the EMS planning, public health planning, as well as health healthcare planning, as well as law enforcement and everybody. Uh, they evacuated three hospitals um, before the storm, um, 72 hours out, I think it was. Um, 19 nursing homes and 16 assisted living facilities, and nobody died. They actually they brought them back and they had patients who came back and they had destinations for them before they left and it was really good. I know they had several hospitals that actually sheltered in place. But it was really amazing. Well, while this was going on, we opened our emergency operations center at the state, public health, and our commissioner said, well, we need to get the identified durable medical equipment data. Well, I have to tell you, it took me a day, this is 72 hours out maybe, a day to get everything signed. 
you have you signed away your firstborn, your secondborn, and then your future generations to get these data because they're all HIPAA protected data. And so we got through, I got to the commissioner who was in and out of the emergency operations center. We finally got it. We had a secure, uh, an epidemiologist had a secure, what? Portal. Oh, portal download, thank you. She did, not me, not her, but yes, her, but anyway. Um, and so we, we got the information and um, essentially what we got was um, for the 30 declared counties. And we got names, addresses, age, telephone numbers, you name it, everything. And it was, oh, about 18,000 records. It was a lot. Uh, that's a lot of people down there, but it was also a lot of information. And my first question is, uh, no, it wasn't a question, sort of panic of, what am I going to do with this stuff? I agree with you. We didn't have any of the planning going on. We were evacuating three hospitals. The EMAs didn't need me to call and say, oh, and by the way, you've got about 3,000 people on oxygen in your, you know, in your declared area. I'm not going to do it. Uh, I probably wouldn't have a job after that. But it's the kind of thing that we need to sort of figure out how to work with this before something happens. And how, but it's got to be local. So this is essentially all of the information for that. Uh, you're going to be quizzed on it later on, but it's motorized wheelchairs and scooters, and I ride Marta, and i got to tell you, they hook up into the electricity of Marta stations. It's a long story, but anyway. But, you know, people on vents, this is not something you want to mess around with. Oxygen, you got a little leeway, but you got to you got to deal with this. These are people who are built at home. They're residentially built, which means they're not in the facility. Okay? So you know where they are. What we didn't know from the data that we got and that we're working on was how many were on each list. Because there were, uh, from this, um, by the time we sort of combined it all, we had the electricity dependent folks, um, there were 62% that were just on one piece of equipment or in one column. Okay, however, there were two, oh, about 33 that had two. And so if you're on oxygen or in dialysis or whatever, it's, you know, then what do you do? How do you, you know, how do you focus your efforts on getting this going where it needs to go? And so that became an issue of, okay, what do we do with all these people and all these names? And after I worked on it for two months and had to finally uh, erase all of the information, um, what we got also on that list, which to me is absolutely the gold mine of all of this stuff, I think I told you that, okay, is the next one. Every single person who was listed on that list had a service provider on the list on who provided them the oxygen, where they got the dialysis, and everything else. And I gotta tell you, I can't get to 17,000 people. I can't get to 9,000 people. I can get to providers. And what I did with the information was I took the list and figured out common providers for the number of people that were here. And what I got was, for oxygen suppliers, which was almost 4,000 people in those 30 counties, there were 19 providers that essentially took care of over 80% of the population. That's, I mean, it's like working with the dialysis companies. You, you, I can't get to everybody, but I can get to the companies. And it goes back to the win-win. Um, if you, you know, if you continue service, if you work with your population, if you give them, you know, some emergency information but also planning ahead of time it really really is good home health care uh, dialysis it tells you home and in facility and then ventilators um, and 10 10 providers did, you know provided 65 percent of the, uh, the, uh, the, the ventilators in the area. and so that's sort of where I see part of this planning going especially for people who are doing dialysis and then everything else um, and trying to get this down to a local level. What we need to do with the dialysis work group is get, we're at the state level. And what we need to do is sort of sprinkle that down. So, so my message to you today is, we don't have enough time to do it all and I can't do it all. Sustaining it is another issue. You know, once you get this started and get the relationships going, it still needs to, you need to sustain it. Um, but the whole idea of forces of change, not to tie it into the conference theme by why not, um, it gets better response that way anyway. Okay, focus on the durable medical equipment service providers. Uh, from our perspective, it's probably the most efficient way to go at this point in trying to get connected, um, establish these public and private partnerships. Uh, you're not paying them, but you're letting them do their job. 
Um, these are their clients, the, you know, their responsibility in some way. It decreases hospital surge, which everybody wants, because uh, you can't do dialysis at the, at the hospital, um, and you just can't take all of these people coming in. Um, and then uh, what it does is, okay, this goes back to the words we have to use, not use, but look for it, is increasing community resilience. Um, getting to the providers to get to their patients or clients, and getting them more resilient by getting more prepared, um, understanding how to deal with this. And I'll stop there. Okay, and questions? I guess that's for all of us. Okay. points I was also picking up the magic Pretty loud. Now it's Um, so a couple of different things also, um, one of the things that we did do after Sandy is we actually did follow, that's the genesis of all the power work, was really watching access and utilization by the dialysis community. So individual patients, we watched 15,000, we followed where they went, did they wind up going to a different provider, did they go to the hospital, did they wind up getting admitted? They wind up just in the ED because of complications. Did they wind up, um, what was their outcomes 30 days post the storm? And one of the things that we did see, which we did learn in Katrina, but we hadn't systematically seen implementation of, in New York, knowing that the storm was coming, Dr. Nirav Shah was the health commissioner, really notified and worked with the dialysis community and said basically, we need you to do early dialysis. It means the day before landfall, bring in everybody a day ahead, we need to build a buffer. We know we're going to get hit. We don't know how long we're going to go down. We usually anticipate about 72, down, 72 hours down for dialysis. It usually takes them also if they need a generator to most of the facilities. And, that, and when I say they, I'm not really talking about <coughs> David and Fresenius that has the capacity to actually bring generators across country. They usually need anywhere from 24 to 72 hours to get fully back online. They try to be on 24, but sometimes it can take a little bit more time. So they really called them and said, please implement early dialysis. And 92% of the facilities did. They brought in over 60% of the population. And we actually saw for the first time ever a protective measure. The, ad, the reduced odds for an ED visit was dropped by 20%. The reduced odds for an inpatient admission was 21%. And the reduced odds of death 30 days post-storm was by 28%. And that was something we were able to see from the population base that unfortunately after Katrina we couldn't really study the population because they were literally spread across the entire country. So even though they have their renal uh, database, they just really couldn't do it. So they weren't actually able to really talk about death in the population even though we knew it happened. We knew that there was a significant increase in death, but we really couldn't prove it. So one of the things I will really encourage you to do is through those communications with your networks and really working with the providers and elevating this awareness to your health commissioners is activating that dialogue and saying, if there's a notice event, triggering them to bring in and start to activate early dialysis. It will be a lifesaver. It's been proven to be a lifesaver. I can give you the article that shows it to you so you can show an evidence case. But it will also help on that surge issue. It showed that there was a decrease in surgery. Still not enough. We still got to work on it and find it. But that was something that came out of it. And what they really focused on also was competition. The luxury of dialysis after Katrina was they are a very unique, they know they had to really stand alone for so many years that a lot of people forgot that they are a healthcare provider. <laughs> Sad but true. We always worried about hospitals and long-term care because we heard about all the travesty, travesties about that. And dialysis was kind of out there, but we really thought about different types of healthcare sectors. We hadn't really paid attention as much as we did to for dialysis. And these recent storms, ice storms, blizzards, hurricanes, tornadoes, it just goes on and on, civil unrest really has brought it more and more to the forefront about that collaboration that's really needed. And they really do have an element of competition, meaning when something's going to go down, they're going to show up and they're going to open their door. And it was this actually in, the, in New York City, there was an independent provider that didn't have a generator. And Fresenius for for said, we'll give you one. <laughs> You've got 600 patients coming in your door. We can't take on any more. We've already taken on so many from the other ones. We're going to give you a generator and we will bring it to you and we will hook it up please stay open. And those are the things that they do do. So I want, you know, when you're, you're working with dialysis, they are they are there for the common good, they're there for continuity care, they really want to take care of their patients, and they're trying to understand, and they're actually really trying to step up to a place to be real true responders. Some of those 
those larger um, providers, such as Divita, they divert. They have an entire team that they created that they go and they bring the next number of hours. They bring um, generators and such. One of the major things that you can also do is notify your emergency managers and your law enforcement through your coalitions and through your engagement and through your ESFA collaborations and when you're in the emergency operations centers is because one of the major hiccups in New York was that DeVita was stopped from being, being able to bring in their gas because they did not understand that they were a critical healthcare provider. And it took them a long time to convince them to let them through. So they were able to be able to stand up, they're like, we got generators, we're able to do this, but not knowing that they are a critical element of healthcare in the community, it slowed them down and it took a while for them to get through it. So here's, this is another way of really elevating an awareness of what actually can happen if you don't integrate dialysis and that shutdown of that access to care, what it causes, and by simple things of recognizing that. Davida got smart <laughs> and said, they took all their trucks after one response and went and painted them red and put some lights on the top and put respiring on the side. He goes, that truck never had a problem again. <laughs> but they don't always have the chance to do that, especially if they're bringing in truckers through gasoline and such. So here's a, here's a provider that's really trying to stay independent and not put more tax, but is being blocked. So think about that when you're talking about who your critical healthcare members are and elevating an awareness with emergency managers and stuff, because sometimes they just don't know. It's not, it's not their background. Yes, so those are the major things I was gonna, I forgot to talk. Questions?